Welcome back to our afternoon section, and it's a pleasure to have Professor Zviburn for these lectures, and he's actually playing both roles, right? Organizing and teaching. And, and I should say he's been recently awarded with the Galileo Galilei Medal, along with his two longtime collaborators, Lance and David. And you should join him with questions, that's what I mean. And mm -hmm. have fun, please, V. Okay, well, thanks a lot for that introduction. Um, so the uh, title is Generalized Unitarity in Loops. And uh, this is with an eye towards gravitational waves. And uh, the first thing we'll spend a little time discussing is what do amplitudes have to do with gravitational waves? Uh, so we've heard these beautiful lectures from Ricardo, and then there's Yaroslav Amplitudes. And I am pretty sure no one in the audience knows how the two are connected. They seem completely different, nothing to do with each other. But in fact, they have a lot to do with each other. And that's uh, what I'll be explaining, what uh, the next week is going to be Radu Roybon, Donald O'Connell, and both of the, all three of us will be talking about that connection. Um, now, uh, what the, after I give you that introduction, well, I'll explain a little bit about the amplitude's way to think about gravity. And you've seen a bit of that already in Yaroslav's talk. Um, so we are not going to be doing things the standard way. Uh, we will not be talking about uh, uh, Einstein's uh, uh, field equation. We will be talking about a spin two particle, a massless spin two particle, just like you heard in Yaroslav's lectures. And from there, we're going to be deriving information about uh, classical physics, about how black holes interact, and also uh, in, in uh, not in my lecture, but in other lectures, about the emission of gravitational waves. And it'll all be done from a viewpoint entirely based on scattering amplitudes and the idea that gravity is mediated by a massless spin two particle. So it's a very different viewpoint. Now, it'll be equivalent, of course. If it wasn't equivalent to Einstein's theory, then it would be wrong. So, of course, it has to be equivalent. Okay? And one of the ideas that we're going to use is something called a double copy, and that, that'll be because of convenience. Uh, so I'll work out, well, there'll be a homework today about working out uh, the potential between, let's say, two charged objects using this viewpoint. And then, of course, we're not that interested in electrodynamics. We're interested in general relativity. And then we'll discuss, uh, that'll be next homework, will be about uh, extracting the potential uh, for, for gravity by basically taking two copies of the electrodynamics case. Okay? And then what we're in, uh, interested in is not just leading order, but to actually show you that these ideas are actually very useful. In my colloquium, I'll talk about uh, the high orders of perturbation theory that we go to using these ideas. Uh, and here, I'm not going to be doing any three or four loop calculations. We'll, we'll stick to one loop. It, it'll, it's the basic idea that instead of leading order, uh, we'll set up next to leading order. So Radu Roybon next week can explain all about how to do things at next to leading order. Uh, and that'll be this generalized unitarity idea. It's something that we use in amplitudes all the time. It was actually developed for doing collider physics, quantum field theory. Okay, so which again comes back to this question, what does that have to do with gravitational waves? Well, we'll get to that. Uh, and then we'll work out some examples. Uh, I'm a great believer that if if, uh, in order to understand something, you should actually see some examples. Maybe it'll get a little laborious, but uh, you got to see an example worked out in a little bit of detail. So we'll work out 
uh, an example in my favorite theory, which is N equals 4 super Yang Mills theory. Um, don't be scared of that. Uh, that theory is nothing more than a Yang Mills theory with a certain spectrum. Uh, that's the way we're going to look at it. So it won't be, uh, it, 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 it won't look too exotic when we do it. Uh, but then the place I hope in lecture number five to be at is an amplitude uh, that will work out for the problem of two interacting black holes. It, it'll be equivalent to that problem, and then Radu is going to turn that into the physics of interacting black holes. Okay, uh, and we'll, we'll just stop at the amplitudes. Okay, so uh, the first thing is. Uh, What, what does, what, um, oh, yeah, before that, let, let me say a couple words um, about the gravitational wave problem. Uh, in order to set the stage for the idea that we can use amplitudes methods, particle physics methods, for the problem of black holes, because the first thing you'll do is raise your hand and say, but black holes are not elementary particles. And that is correct. They're pretty big objects, right? They're not elementary particles. So how in the world are we going to directly use quantum field theory designed for elementary particles for the problem of black holes? Right? And um, that, that uh, requires a little bit of explanation. So first, let's just go back to the problem we're looking at. Um, so uh, let's say the original detection, I can tell you the minute it happened. It was September 14th, 2015, 5.51 uh, a.m. Okay, then you have to go 1.2 billion years back in time. Uh, an event happened, and that was, uh, you know, Ricardo explained all about that. Okay, there's two black holes in orbit. They're emitting gravitational waves. The gravitational waves coming off. Uh, actually, I should let me draw it like this. Uh, and um, if we look at this, um, at this problem, actually, Ricardo told you what the wavelength was. Um, I guess it was around a thousand kilometers. Okay, so right there at that point, the idea of the wavelength is a thousand kilometers. How big are the black holes? I think he also told you the size of black holes, maybe he said 10 kilometers. So let's see, 10 kilometers, that's a lot smaller than a thousand kilometers. So to the emission of the gravitational waves, what does a black hole look like? Point. Okay, there you go. So let's draw this to scale. There we go. That's better. They're points. Okay, so we're heading in the right direction. If they're points, that sounds like something maybe we can use quantum field theory for, because what's quantum field theory about? It's the study of elementary point-like objects. Okay, the elementary, uh, that has to do with, uh, with, um, with uh, the types of interactions there can be. But still they're points, so that certainly sounds like quantum field theory. And then there is something else, okay. Where are we going to use perturbation theory? Okay, when the two black holes get too close, then the size of the black hole is important, so you can't use perturbation theory. So by definition, we're going to be looking at the problem where this distance is also large. Okay, I don't know, let's make it 100 kilometers, right? So once again, there's a scale separation. There's a separation of scales. The wavelength is very large. The distance between the black holes is very large. Sure sounds like point particles to me. Now, this idea of separation of scales
is, in a sense, the key to everything. It's not just the key to why we are going to be able to use elementary particle physics to describe black holes. It's the entire way that you could say you do physics. So effective field theory, maybe you've heard about that. Uh, that's based on separation of scales. I'll give you a nice example of an effective field theory. It's Einstein's theory of gravity. If we think of it as a quantum field theory, quantum mechanically, you might say everybody knows that the, um, the uh, theory of gravity is incomplete. Einstein is incomplete. And you know, you've heard all that propaganda. Uh, you just forget about it. Not important. Separation of scales, ultraviolet unknown physics. So very short distance physics is irrelevant in quantum field theory. Okay? And also, in, let's say, Ricardo, uh, he's going to be speaking about these multipole expansions, for example. That's another example. There's a separation of scales of how you describe things. And he, too, will be describing the black holes as point objects. So we have no monopoly on this concept. This is a universal concept you'll find everywhere in physics, that if you're interested in long-scale physics, you don't need to know the details about the short-scale physics. Okay. And this theme of the separation of, sc of scales uh, will be extremely important uh, for uh, how we do things and why it works. And uh, in particular, I'm going to write down a Feynman diagram, the same Feynman diagram that you find for quantum gravity of a scalar, let's say, a scalar particle, elementary particle, and I'll say, black hole, just like that. And magically, it's not magically, it's effective field theory, separation of scales, it's the identical problem, truly the identical problem. Okay. Um, now, there's something else that's important. We're going to talk about, uh, there it is, amplitudes, scattering amplitudes. Now, why might you be interested in scattering amplitudes? Uh, if you're interested uh, really in the bound problem. So the real problem, in the sense, the phenomenology that you're really interested in is not a scattering process of two black holes passing each other and, and gravitationally interacting, emitting gravitational waves. I mean, that's an interesting problem, but that's not, you could say, fundamental. Um, it's fundamental to the phenomenology of what's measured at the detectors. Maybe someday in the future there'll be some events, okay, scattering somewhere in the universe that'll be measured, but that, that's clearly not the key driving reason why someone who doesn't do scattering amplitudes, let's say your average general relativist is interested in, in this problem, uh, why would they be interested in scattering? And the answer, is uh, in the scattering process. So here's a scattering process. We start over here, and then uh, uh, there's, let's say you bend around. Uh, let me just draw this correctly. So there's a black hole here, and it gets bent by this one, and this one gets bent the other way, something like this. So the, the gravitational scattering problem is very clean, theoretically clean. When you get the high orders of perturbation theory, there's a lot of grief coming from the fact that general relativity, like the name says, it's generally coordinate invariant. Right? There's the general coordinate invariance, and that can cause great chaos and confusion. But if you're thinking about a scattering process, out here is Minkowski. All right. This thing starts in Minkowski space. There's this particle, or black hole, and it starts in Minkowski space, and then uh, it winds up again on this side. Out here, it's also Minkowski. Okay. 
So it's flat space. Flat space means that the states, what's, what's the state? You're not, general, well, I shouldn't say you're not confused, but the level of confusion is much lower. So it turns out that our friends, the gravitational wave, all our gravitational fr uh, wave friends, are interested in scattering because they're getting to very high orders of perturbation theory, and it's easier to deal with conceptual subtle problems. So it just happens to be good for us because we do scattering. Okay? So scattering, let me just say scattering uh, is simpler. Okay, theoretically simpler is what I mean. Okay? Uh, conceptually simpler. Okay? Um, so maybe this is one point why you might really want to focus on this, um, especially as you're pushing to higher and higher orders of perturbation theory. Uh, and then there's uh, another point, and this has to do with the separation of scales again. Suppose you're looking at a nearly circular orbit, okay, and it's decaying, right? So there's a spiral, right, spiraling around like this. There's another separation of scales you can make use of. So um, when you first hear about the idea of separating the, um, uh, the, the conservative part from the dissipative, dissipative means radiation goes out, takes away energy. You say, you can't do that because general relativity is a nonlinear theory. Everything interacts with everything, and you, you can't make that separation. But again, the separation of scales. So there's the orbital frequency, and there's the decay frequency, or the decay, uh, the, the, the dec I should say the de decay time. Uh, so if you have a separation of scales, that if in one orbit you go around, the frequency shift, because the orbit has changed, is very small, then you can, in fact, separate the problem into two pieces. And this will be very important. There's uh, time scale separation. So there's you could say delta omega in one orbit divided by the orbital frequency. And as long as this is small, the way we should do it is adiabatically. You calculate one orbit, ignoring the radiation. Then what you do is you figure out the radiation, and you back react it, and you separate the problems. And that's why Radu, in particular me a little bit, will talk about potentials. We'll talk about conservative uh, motion. We're talking, right, we're talking about an orbit that's decaying. So how can you talk about conservative motion? I'll talk about Hamiltonians. You know, so don't raise your hand and say, you're not allowed to use a Hamiltonian because the orbit is decaying, there's friction, right? Uh, but because of the separation of time scales, this thing is going to be very small. We calculate circular orbit or we calculate you know, an orbit, and then uh, that's done conservatively. Then you calculate the radiation that would happen, and then you feed that back to figure out the decay. Okay? So I will talk about, so this is actually conservative. That, that's the piece I'll focus on. Uh, I, I believe that uh, Donald O'Connell, he will talk about radiation using these methods. Okay. Now, to get a little more specific, let's look at this process here. Okay. I assume you've all had, uh, you all know what a Feynman diagram is. So Yaroslav got so advanced, he, he doesn't use Feynman diagrams, but this is a very simple one. Let's make this scalar, and this thing is a graviton. Okay, and it's not very hard to calculate. Um, or so, um, I, I said that these things, this thing can be a black hole. 
or it can be an elementary particle. Either one. Okay? And it's literally, I mean, this in a sense is the translation between Yaroslav's lecture and Ricardo's lecture. So this diagram is the diagram for black hole scattering, two black holes sc scattering through a, um, through a gra uh, well, through a graviton here. Okay. Now, uh, you might think that still this is somehow quantum because it's only one graviton. Well, we'll get to that. This thing, as we'll see, is directly related to the potential between two black holes. It's like literally the same thing after a Fourier transform. Okay? And that's, I think, quite remarkable. If it wasn't for this simple fact that there is a relationship, right, that the black hole, this Feynman diagram, its Fourier transform is, in fact, a classical potential uh, suitably interpreted, uh, then, then of course this wouldn't be working very well. But because it's so simple at the leading order in perturbation theory, it gives you a hint that maybe there's something powerful here. Yeah. Yes, so the methods, all perturbative methods, so if you hear post-Newtonian, post-Minkowski, all perturbative methods are based uh, on the separation of scales, and we do not, we do not uh, have information near the merger where the approximation fails. So the idea is you have an approximation that works as long as they're sufficiently far. If they get too close, you need another technique. There is such a technique, of course. It's called numerical relativity for dealing with the final merger. Okay? But either way, the idea is to collect information. What you're trying to do to build a proper model of the merger is you need detailed information, precision information, that you gather from perturbation theory, and then you combine it with information precision information from numerical relativity. Numerical relativity does poorly when the black holes are far apart, and the reason is because now you have many scales and it becomes much harder to do. But the perturbative methods take advantage of that separation of scales. So it, it's, anyway, it, it, it's not that, uh, okay, it, I'm not sure what R Ricardo will cover, but presumably he'll say uh, more about this. And so, yeah. Oh, um, and something very important. This is crucial in, in like your thinking. So virtually any question that you're going to ask me, let's say any question about the applicability or how does it work, uh, it, it's identical. Almost any question is identical to what would happen if you're doing ordinary general or Einstein's equations, post-Newtonian, Ricardo's lecture, exactly Ricardo's lecture. Because the setups, the, map, the mapping between the two methods is very simple. It's calculating the same things. Okay, and uh, I'm not sure if Ricardo will say it in his lecture. Probably he will at some point. Let me just say, the difference between the post-Newtonian that he talks about, and we're going to talk about something called post-Minkowskian, is you take what we have, you expand the velocity, and they have to be identical. If they're not identical, it's wrong, okay? So, uh, in a sense, we rely, the whole setup here is designed to match, uh, like, term by term on, on, what they, on what the traditional approach is, okay? So there's, uh, I'll be talking about some weird things, but at least the, you could say, the physics of the black holes, the mergers, how it's done, that part, we're completely standard. Okay. And if we were not, there'd be a problem with what we're doing. Okay. okay, so 
the um, the problem that I will talk about and Radu Raiban, what he will talk about, will be just the conservative part. That means ignore radiation, taking use, uh, making use of this separation of time scales that the orbit decays slowly compared to the uh, the the, or, the orbital frequency. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, absolutely. So I, I was uh, mix, you could say mixing them. So can you repeat his yeah. question? To yeah. Uh, oh, oh, so sorry. So uh, he was pointing out that uh, mixing on the same blackboard, you see this, and I keep on referring to this, and then I'm talking about a scattering. Okay, so at low orders of perturbation theory, life is good because what happens is the continuation between the two problems is trivial. If you work out a Hamiltonian, a conservative Hamiltonian for this problem, lo and behold, it's the same Hamiltonian, right? It's the same physics. When you get to a sufficiently high order of perturbation theory, then life is a little more complicated. There's something called the tail effect and non-locality, and there's a little bit of chaos. But at least at low orders of perturbation theory, the scattering problem and the uh, or the, uh, um, the orbital problem, they're identical. And just as one obvious example, uh, you may remember when you were an undergraduate and you were learning about Newtonian mechanics and the Newtonian potential and the Newtonian gravity. And you may remember that when you solved the scattering problem, you simultaneously solved this. It was all the same, right? And that holds to higher orders of perturbation theory, but at some point it breaks down. Oh, are loop diagrams still actual? Ah, <laughs> oh well, spin. Well, <coughs> yeah, spin. So a, sp a spin is a, l a spin. Well, let's see which part should I? Uh, okay, so. There's something I, I didn't explain, but I assure you, uh, Radu Raivan is gonna, going to beat, you, beat this to death, is in, this, in these diagrams, there are quantum effects, but they are separated. There is an expansion, a soft expansion. There's a certain you know, h-bar counting. Basically, it amounts to keeping track of h-bars, and what you do is you just throw away anything that has an H bar on it, right? So this, let's see, this diagram and the higher order ones, they contain classical and they contain quantum. So you just tag who's quantum, toss it. So that's the end of quantum. Now spin, well, one thing is at least anything we're gonna talk about, this will be a scalar spinless. So let's see, what kind of black hole am I talking about? Am I talking about a Kerr black hole, which is spinning? No, because this has no spin. I'm talking about a Schwarzschild black hole. If I want to talk about a Kerr black hole, then what I need to do is consider spinning particles. Okay, and, and that, in fact, you can do, and, and there's a, I don't know, many, many papers on that. Uh, but um, but it, it's, uh, it's certainly something that, uh, that you would have to account for, uh, you know, in the sense that when you write down your quantum field theory for a scalar particle, you're not talking about a spinning particle. And the same for a black hole. If you're writing down a scalar field and a scalar particle, that's clearly not a spinning black hole. So you have to, uh, if you want spin, then you have to do it slightly differently than what I'll show you. Um, okay. Um, and and uh, actually, the remarkable, maybe one more comment on that that I can't resist saying, is th the remarkable thing is it's the same damn formalism. So <laughs> electrons and black holes, spin, uh, well, if you're only interested in, let's say, spin orbit, no problem. 
They're identical. You can use the same formalism. Okay, and as you are interested in interactions, like higher spin interactions, spin cubed, and so forth, then there's a more complicated story. But again, you design a quantum field theory with higher spin. Okay. Now, the problem we're going to look at, and, and this was this thing about separation of scales, that uh, we can just look at the conservative part if we're interested in orbital decay, which ultimately we're in, that's what we're really interested in. But we're looking at the scattering problem because, as I said, it's simpler. Okay. So we will look at the conservative. It does not mean that the dissipative part is unimportant. It's equally important because, after all, you're interested in the radiation. The radiation carries away energy. That's the dissipative part. So it's not a question of, of uh, what's more important. It's just a question of simplifying the problem, make it easier to see what's going on by separating out pieces that you can separate by using the separation of time scales. Okay. So conservative part. So how do you do the conservative part? Well, what you'd like is a Hamiltonian. How else do you do conservative? And let's do this in the uh, center of mass. So in the center of mass, if I have two particles, the m1, so there's two particles, and they're uh, doing whatever they're doing, either scattering or, or in orbit around each other. And when the center of mass frame, the momenta of the particles are equal and opposite. Okay. So I'll put in the same p square, m2 square. Okay, that's the kinetic, right? Because we're relativistic. And then I write down a potential, v of r and p, and then the masses. Now, the only thing that's a little unusual is there's a p in here, right? Uh, that the potential depends on. Uh, the momentum, but perhaps that shouldn't surprise you, we're going to be looking at general relativity. So if we're looking at the very lowest order with just Newton, then obviously we know the potential. Uh, well, let's write down Newton. M1 well, is G, M1, M2 divided by R. So our task is to write down the corrections from general relativity to this thing. Okay? Some of it was obvious. Right? This is just the kinetic energy relativistic Lorentz invariant. That's the correct Hamiltonian for the Lorentz invariant theory. But we want systematically to get this potential order by order. One time, um, by construction. Now, what happens, actually, your point is very well taken. So what happens, uh, you're probably puzzled. Wait a second. Uh, last I heard, general relativity involves the propagation, right? You know, uh, the speed of light and propagation. How come you're doing it local in time? Uh, so indeed, there's a problem once you get the high enough order of perturbation theory, that this little picture breaks down. And it's actually connected to my comment before. Uh, I said, well, the scattering problem and this problem are the same. And that's why I was mixing them up. They're all the same. And that's true uh, at low orders of perturbation theory. But at high orders, in fact, the non-locality of the interactions, the fact that there's finite propagation time, it catches up with you. And then there's a literature about tail effect and so on and so forth. Uh, but we're good to go, certainly at the order of perturbation theory that we're working at. You can just do this. And uh, as far as I can tell, the reason why it's done this way, you know, why you would want to do this is because Newton did it. So you keep on doing it until you start hitting trouble. And then you build epicycles. The name of the epicycle is tail effect. And you, you, know, you keep a memory effect. You keep on building up. 
more and more complexity to make up for the point you just made that, in fact, what, there's something wrong here. But higher orders of perturbation theory, so I'm happy and I'll ignore it. Okay, so let's have a look. What's the connection of this diagram to this thing? And for homework, we're going to look in more detail, but let's have a quick look. So, um, should I, oops, I say I misspelled that, but okay. Okay, let's look at a Feynman diagram. So the, the top half of this diagram, let's put some labels. There's a one, two, three, four. Let's say momentum Q gets exchanged. Okay, and this thing is a scalar particle. Uh, and uh, yeah, so th this, th this thing is a scalar particle. And uh, what does this interaction look like? Well, I'll just be sloppy. For homework, you'll, we'll put in all the factors. Uh, so this thing, if you look this up in Bjorken and Drell or whatever your favorite textbook on quantum field theory, what's the Feynman vertex? Uh, I, w I want this to be massive. So Yaroslav's beautiful lectures, you know, I can't directly quote because uh, anyway, these are, this is a massive particle here. Uh, and this is, there's a mu and a nu here, uh, and P2 minus P3 nu. So that's the vertex, okay? Uh, and we need to do the Feynman rules. So I'll take two of these, one on top, one on the bottom, and then I'm going to glue them together, okay? Now, um, we'll leave the details for later. Uh, actually, today's homework will be the wrong theory, electrodynamics, because it's simpler, and then the next day we can do gravity. Okay? But let's just uh, wave our hands appropriately here. This diagram, we know how it behaves. There's a propagator here. So during Yaroslav's lecture, Maybe the one thing you should remember is there's a propagator and a pole. That pole, it goes like 1 over q squared. So this diagram is going to go like 1 over q squared. And let's look at these momenta. So suppose we're interested in Newton. So that means it's static. OK, so I can write down, oh, and let's go to the center of mass. And let's make it static. So what's P1? Minus M, OK. It's, well, it's a pretty stupid center of mass since it's static. And anyway, momentum is 0. This is E equals. Okay, let's make this a 4 vector. There's P2. That's M1. P2 is uh, M2 and 0. And then P3. So it's one, two, three, same mass here and here. So this thing has to be, P3 has to be equal to, uh, so this should be with a minus sign. This one is M2 and this is zero. And this is uh, that's P4, which is equal to M1 and zero. So the Feynman vertices, they're just constants, the masses, right? So forget about them. They're, they don't play a role in this. So if you're talking about not static, then indeed these numerators, the vertices, will be much more complicated, not just some constants. And that has to do with this dependence on momentum, the fact that if the things are moving, then there'll be a correction to Newton's potential. And that comes out of this Feynman very right here. But for the case we're looking at, where it's Newton, it's just a bunch of constants. 
So never mind those constants. This is the only thing I need to know. Okay. Now, let's suppose that, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, minimal it's minimal coupling. Um, can, can you repeat his question, please? Oh, oh, sorry. He's asking whether I was using minimal coupling. Uh, and indeed I am. Let me just jump slightly ahead about something. You may then ask a related question. Why do black holes have minimal coupling? Okay, and, and the answer is, in general, they don't. But there's a systematic expansion, finite size, Tidal effects. Okay, there's stor interesting stories about uh, tidal effects with black holes, but in general, uh, there are higher dimension operators that couple, but they're systematically organized according to some uh, separation of scales. I mean, there's a whole formalism of how you're supposed to do that. But if you're interested, and you could say, uh, uh, ignoring tidal effects. So it's very simple. I declare I'm not interested in tidal effects, minimal coupling. It's as simple as that. Okay. Um, and that's what we're going to do here. We ignore all that, make believe there's no such thing uh, with black holes, which is uh, more, or less, more or less true, but not exactly. Um, right, ah, yes, this thing. Ah, so the next thing is we're interested in a conservative process, right? That's what we mean by a potential. So that means the energy here is the energy here in the center of mass, right? That's where we're working. So therefore, no energy is exchanged here. And we have fancy words. We call that the potential modes of the graviton. Right, so we're only interested in uh, co conservative parts. So in fact, this Q, we should really take this Q to be like this. Okay. There's no component here. Now, what's the relationship of this thing and the potential? Well, suppose you're doing non-relativistic uh, quantum mechanics or, uh, qu or maybe set up a quantum field theory, but non-relativistic theory. Uh, then, in fact, the way you'd get this contribution is by Fourier transforming the potential. Right? So, in fact, this potential, the nice formula or the connection between this thing and what we're really interested in, the corrections to the potential, is a simple formula. It's it just, if you want, or maybe I should write it like this. V, up to some normalization, uh, V, uh, P, and R, it's proportional to this thing. It's literally the same thing. All we have to do to, free, to, to get the normal potential, the way Newton would write it down, is we would write V of PR equals the Fourier transform d cubed Q, 2 pi cubed. And then it would be V, oh, this should be, sorry, Q, sorry. Uh, V of P and Q, uh, E to the I, Q dot R. Whoops. Where'd it go? Now, suppose I want a Fourier transform. Uh, I need some space. Let me make a little space. Yes, yeah, so what is 
integral d cubed q of 2 pi cubed e to the i q dot r. And then what do I have here? What's our potential? 1 over q squared. Okay. And then q is like, it's the three-dimensional one, 1 over q vector squared. Well, for homework, we'll get all the factors straight. But up to the, there it is, 1 over r. Right? Gee, I seem to have seen that somewhere. So then the homework will be, we have to get all those factors right in order to get exactly Newton. Okay? So th this is actually very profound in the sense it says the Feynman diagram, this one, is the potential directly. Okay? And there's a piece I was hiding, which is you do have to take h bar goes to 0. There will be uh, something to discuss about that. I mean, in general, and Roy Bond will definitely discuss a lot about that. But still, you see how this works. Go to the static limit. The leading order contribution, this thing, is Newton, literally Newton. But on top of it, we have, from these vertices, we have now corrections that come from general relativity. Now, you notice, I did not say anywhere Einstein's equation. It's kind of hiding in there, because where, does, where do the Feynman rules come from, at least the normal way? Uh, but that's not the way we're going to think about it. We're thinking about it. Let me write down the only thing I can write down for a massless spin-2 interaction that's consistent. You heard Yaroslav's lecture. He was talking about something slightly different, massless particles. But the logic is this is the key, the key, uh, the key point is from massless spin 2, so that's the input. So that's all I'm going to assume. We're not going to use Einstein's equation. This is the only thing we're going to use. Massless spin 2 particle, which car that's the force carrier. And then I write down a consistent set of scattering amplitudes. We are going to get uh, systematic uh, corrections to Newton. Now, in particle physics, we like to work relativistically. We're going to use relativistic quantum field theory, fully relativistic. So we will have all orders in velocity. You could say that's built into the way we like to do things. And that's completely natural in a scattering process because the velocity can be arbitrarily large. You're not, there's no constraint. If you're talking about the bound case, there are constraints. There are uh, relations, the velocity square and, and the potential, anyway, kinetic energy and potential energy in a bound system are essentially the same, proportional to each other. Um, so there, you could say that it's less relevant to go higher orders in velocity, except maybe in highly elliptical orbits. But this is built into the way we think about things. So you're, you're capturing analytic information by looking at this. This is called post-Minkowskian the relationship to post-Newtonian that you'll hear in, Ricard in Ricardo's lectures is you expand the velocity. That expansion in velocity takes post-Minkowskian 
turns it into post-Newtonian. Okay, so um, maybe a few, yeah. Say again? Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, so the black holes, of course, don't, don't do that because they're radiating. But to simplify the problem or, you, you know, chop it into pieces and, Say something, oh, in the bound state, we're bound case, we're really interested in a separation of scale, the separation of conservative from, of, of, from the dissipative. Uh, but so it, it, it's not like the physics wants it to be conservative. We're doing this for convenience. Okay. Uh, and another, actually, there's one very big advantage of focusing on conservative, you notice how little effort it took to hit Newton, to come to Newton, to take general relativity and say, look, this is how you get Newton. Okay. Now, um, let me just say a few words about uh, uh, Lagrangian approaches. So we're, we're not going to use Lagrangians for general relativity. Uh, we will actually use a little bit for talking about gauge theory, a simpler theory. And then we will promote that to a theory of gravity uh, through something very interesting that uh, was hiding in Yaroslav's talk. He, he mentioned something that's a hint of what I'll be saying about a relationship that we can exploit between the uh, gauge theory and the uh, gravity theory. But just to orient, you say for orientation purposes, let's just write down some Lagrangians. So, so this would be the gauge, the gauge theory. And there was uh, Yang Mills theory. So there was just a beginning of that in Yaroslav's lecture. And we want to couple it to a massive theory, a massive scalar field. Okay, and this is the covariant derivative. Okay, I, I hope you're all familiar with this. There's no surprises here. Um, so this is one theory that we'll be discussing. Uh, its Feynman rules will be pretty simple. Also, for if it's Maxwell theory, you just cross that out. It's the Feynman rules will be very simple. Okay. Uh, and also, there's gravity. And there, the Feynman rules are not so simple. But let's just write something down. Uh, and then I'll talk about it. So this, I think many of you said you've taken general relativity courses. Uh, presumably you've seen Einstein-Hilbert action at some point. Um, I mean, it's really just the generator of the field equations. That's nothing deeper than that. And um, of course, we, we're talking about perturbation theory. So we are. Uh, Expanding this way, this kappa, kappa square will be uh, 32 pi uh, g Newton. How, oh, how do I know that? Because if you do this carefully, right, you see this Feynman diagram is directly related to the Newton potential. If there's kappas here, these are the interactions. Uh, the ca there, you can translate. Uh, you can directly translate that. So th this constant, it's the square root of Newton's constant. Okay. Um, now, th this theory, we will use Feynman rules, uh, and the reason we're going to use Feynman rules is because we're going to be talking about very simple amplitudes. So 
if it's that simple, why are you bothering with uh, fancy things like Yaroslav was describing? Right? Just, just do it a standard way. For gravity, it's very, it'll be much more difficult to make use of this Lagrangian. Okay, you can also put in matter terms corresponding to this. Very, uh, it's a similar term. I can take that and throw it in there. But the covariant deriv derivative is, of course, different. It's not for gauge theory. It's for gravity. Okay. So let's just talk briefly about Feynman rules. So I'll just quote them. Uh, so I'll quote the ones that we will find useful in the lecture. Okay. So first, there's a scalar. So when I say scalar, you think Schwarzschild black hole. Okay, it's, it's the same thing. Um, and that has a propagator, like so. So this is the uh, Schwarzschild, whoops, the Schwarzschild black hole. Uh, okay, we'll talk about gluons or also electromagnetic. Electro electromagnetism and uh, QCD or gluons, uh, the photons, gluons, at this level it's all the same, just there's many gluons as Yaroslav explained, but only one photon, so gluons uh, we would write down a propagator. So maybe I'll draw a picture. There's a mu, a nu, an a, and a b. So this would be in what's called Feynman gauge, which I hope everyone is familiar with. Or, uh, everyone has taken a class in particle physics, yes? Any no's? OK, good. Uh, P squared minus M squared plus I epsilon. Uh, the minus sign is because I'm a West Coast, the West Coast of the United States. They use the metric you know, plus, minus, 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 which if you've taken a general relativity class, you're going to think we're crazy, but OK. Um, so that, that's the source of this funny minus sign there. Uh, and then. Um, for the graviton, well, we're not actually going to directly use this, but let me just write it down because we're we're going to use we're going to do something pretty close to this Feynman pro this Feynman propagator for gravitons. So of course, you have to work in some gauge, and there's a specific gauge, the Donder gauge, and in that gauge. Uh, in that gauge, the propagator is I over P squared. Okay. Um, oh, and let me draw a graviton. So there's uh, mu nu. Oh, this should be. I guess I had it different, differently, uh, mu rho, and then sigma. So there's the complication of extra indices, extra Lorentz indices. So that makes this a little more complicated. So there's mu rho, eta, nu, sigma. Oh, I see I am not moving very quickly. Uh, eta, uh, mu, sigma, uh, eta, uh, new row, and then minus 2 over d minus 2, eta uh, mu nu, uh, eta rho sigma. Okay. And uh, there's actually something important here. It's this thing. So this thing, this part here, 
uh, you could say it's pretty simple in the sense, what's a graviton, a symmetric tensor? So I have to symmetrize the indices. It's symmetric, so that has to be reflected that mu can go to rho, mu can go to sigma, because things are identical. This thing is a bit more annoying, as we'll see. Uh, this has to do with the subtraction of the trace, there, right? And even though we're not going to be do, doing Feynman rules, keep an eye on this guy. Uh, this is going to enter into the story that I'll be telling you about the double copy. I see I'm doing very poorly on time. OK. Uh, now, maybe I will skip things. OK, so in Yaroslav's lecture, he's discussing tree amplitudes. In my lecture, I want to get to loops. It's in the title. Loops. Now, the loops correspond to higher orders of perturbation theory. So if I'm just looking at perturbation theory, right, and I want to write down the first order contribution, like this, that's the diagram. I find Newton in here. Good. OK, but where do I find the next post-Newtonian correction? It, it's only a piece could be found in here because only, see this thing, it goes like G, and then it could be higher order in velocity, so maybe one plus V square. So the one, we'll call that Newton. This thing is post-Newtonian, but there's another post-Newtonian piece that we're missing, and where could it be? Well. It doesn't take a genius to count Gs, right? If two couplings, there's a kappa and a kappa, these are couplings, they make a G. Well, how do I get a G square, right? I take a diagram like this. So the problem that we are going to want to talk about is how to compute these things. What's the amplitude's way to do it? So we want to talk about loops. Loops means higher order. Right? So I'm just doing G counting. What's the next diagram? Right? And so on and so forth. You can just keep on adding more and more diagrams with more and more powers of uh, essentially Newton's constant. And the question is how to compute this. Now, one possibility is, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK, so. Re um, repeat the question. Please. Yeah, OK. Oh, sorry. So he, he asked a great question. Uh, it's actually a very fun question because, um, of course, uh, we asked ourselves this question when we started because what the hell is going on? Because back in graduate school, I distinctly remember learning something important, uh, or it sounded important, which was uh, they said, loops are quantum, trees are classical. That's what you're worried about. Well, it turns out the solution of this uh, dilemma of like what's going on is what you learned is wrong. <laughs> uh, and the, re the way it's wrong is actually quite interesting. Um, so if you follow what, they, what you were taught and you do the h-bar scaling the way you were, they told you, indeed, it's absolutely true what they say. But that's not what we're doing here. We're asking. Uh, in fact, you could say the proper question, um, which is, if I want to extract the classical physics, the general relativity, how am I supposed to do the scaling? Okay? And that's actually a distinct question. So the error that was taught to you, taught to me, uh, is not that, uh, not, not that 
Uh, you could say in detail, like if you follow what they said, it's indeed correct what they said. H bar, lo loops have H bar. The error was that they implied that that's uh, not relevant for classical physics. Right? They, maybe they didn't say it explicitly, not relevant for classical physics, but it was definitely implied. And that is incorrect. And the source of the problem can be explained right here. See, you've got to keep an eye on this fellow, this thing. What's this momentum here? Does this thing scale like h bar? Uh, or, or, you know, there's the relationship, you know, p equals h bar k, right? So p's... Momenta, you think, oh yeah, I'm supposed to scale it uh, a core, you know, it's like, there it is. But this is the momentum of a black hole, right? That's a, that's a big guy, right? This is a classical momentum. There ain't no H bars in this momentum. On the other hand, if you analyze carefully what you're interested in, uh, then these momenta, the, the gravitons, they actually do scale with h bar when you're trying to ex extract the classical physics. Okay, and Radu, I'm sure, will go into great detail to explain exactly this point. Okay, and, and it's actually a very amusing example because it's something that's taught in class, uh, and I'm embarrassed to say I taught it. I said that in my class. Okay, that's when I was younger and not as wise, but. But in any case, I said it. Uh, and, and, you know, it was literally, if you follow what they say, you know, the logic, indeed it's true. They go like H bar. And uh, maybe one little kicker to amuse you is, in fact, it doesn't go like H bar. It goes like 1 over H bar. So it's maximally wrong what was said, like completely inverted. This thing, this thing, a piece of this thing goes like 1 over H bar, and then a there's a, a piece that's underneath it that goes like h bar to the zero, which is the classical piece that you're interested in. Okay? Um, and this, anyway, Radu will explain this at great length. I'm not going to get there because I'm not going to be taking the classical limit of this thing. Yeah. Excuse me? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So in here, you're absolutely right, there are quantum pieces. For example, uh, a piece like this, uh, they got that right. There's an, there's an H bar. This guy is definitely quantum. And, and if you just look at the diagram, you say, nah, I don't think this one's classical, right? Uh, so indeed, in here, there are pieces that need to be thrown away, dropped. Uh, the solution to your problem of what you keep and what you drop is a set of simple rules. One rule is you, ex you expand in the graviton momenta. Every graviton carries an H, the graviton momentum relative to this carries an H bar. So you series expand and then you stop when you hit the classical and then you throw everything else away. And the other rule is that you have to have, in every loop, one uh, matter propagator. And the reason for that is, uh, can be intuitively understood. So if you look at here, D4P, so that's equal to DE uh, D cubed P. So this thing, this integral, the loop integral, right, is inherently quantum. And the reason why it's inherently quantum is because Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is built into this thing. The energy and the momentum don't satisfy, you know, e square, e square minus p square equals m square, okay? It doesn't satisfy that because you're integrating independently. So, so you say, well, that, that can't, this has to be quantum. On the other hand, if you have a pole here and you pick up a residue, it's the residue that brings you back classically. So there's a set of rules, once you understand them, of where the corners of this integral are, 
where the classical pieces are hiding, then you can separate it out. And this, in the beginning, is very confusing what's going on, but once you understand the set of rules, it's very straightforward. You just follow a set of rules, and it tells you where to pick up all the classical pieces, and you can separate quantum and classical uh, very straightforwardly by just following the rules. Okay. Uh, since I see I'm actually pretty late, so I guess questions. Uh, 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 not exactly. I, 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 you need one of them. One of them is on shell, and one of them is off shell. Because, y y yeah, it's just one residue. Once you pick up the residue, you can't pick up another one. Uh, but in fact, the contributions they come from, in terms of Feynman diagram. Well, let me just. So in terms of Feynman diagrams, they they come from two places. Maybe I'll just draw it like this, even though these aren't really uh, Feynman diagrams. But in terms of integrals, this is one contribution. It's a triangle integral where you're fixed on that residue, and you pick up, you pick up the classical, one classical piece, and the other classical piece is the inverse of this thing. Uh, and I, these are all very good questions because the... When we began this, thinking about this problem, of course, we were quite confused about things we learned in graduate school, which were not exactly, exactly uh, correct. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, it could be anything. So Repeat in, his in, question, please. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. So he's, yeah, uh, thanks for reminding me. Uh, I'll, I'll try to get better about that. Uh, okay. uh, so he's asking, uh, why are we thinking about black holes and not neutron stars? Well, the reason why I use the word black holes is because black holes are cool, <laughs> plain and simple. But there's literally no difference because it's, we're taking advantage of the separation of scales. We're taking advantage of the fact that I said no tidal effects, right? So these, the neutron star, the black hole, all the same, no difference whatsoever. Uh, it, it's when at higher orders, you may worry about tidal effects, which are quite different in neutron stars and black holes, but you can systematically correct that through effective field theory. There's a set of higher dimension operators you write down and so forth. But the lowest dimension operator, the, the one we're talking about, so you're very far away, and you're just looking at you know, potentials, uh, very far away, and uh, looking at leading contributions, then neutron star equals black hole, or any asteroid. It could be the Earth, it could be the Sun, makes no difference. No, I, okay. So, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I, actually, I, I, I'm not completely sure because, you know, we're the bosses, right? So we are only interested, we just said, or, I, you know, I just declared, we're only interested in classical physics. And the reason why we're only interested in classical physics is because that's what's relevant for the gravitational wave problem. So, in a sense, the math problem, it's now a complete math problem. We're doing quantum field theory, but we're identifying the corners of the integrals or the corner of the quantum field theory where you only get the classical piece and you literally drop it. Now, if you decided you're interested in, let's say, the first h-bar correction between the moon and the earth, yeah, no problem, you can calculate it. So, um, uh, but in a sense, the main answer to the question of uh, the, like the mixing, uh, you know, we're doing quantum and what does that have to do with classical is we're literally throwing away the quantum. So it's classical. Okay. 
Yes. Okay. Okay. No, but we, okay. repeat that, the oh, 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 sorry. So he, the com general complaint is why are we quantizing? Or, or we were just talking about, uh, let's say, uh, the calculating the potential between the moon and the Earth, which indeed this calculation is doing that because, like I said, it doesn't matter if it's the Earth or a black hole or a neutron star. Same calculation, as long as you're far enough away and you're ignoring tidal effects and so forth. Um, so the complaint is, uh, you know, why are, we, uh, why are we quantizing it? And the answer is, uh, to first approximation, we are not interested at all in quantizing it. We are interested in using the tools of scattering amplitudes and our new understanding of gravity, the amplitude's understanding of gravity, to apply it to state-of-the-art calculations in classical physics, so it, it, you could, so there's a there's a framework, um, or what we're doing might look very mysterious. We want to do classical physics, and then we say, oh, the way we should do it is by using quantum field theory. And then you're probably thinking these guys are maniacs because quantum field theory is very hard, and classical physics should be easier, right? But that uh, point, that quantum field theory is very hard, especially quantum gravity, is not entirely true because over the years in the scattering amplitudes community, like you were hearing, let's say, Yaroslav lecture, we now have a very good understanding of how to do scattering amplitudes. Right? So there's a technical advance, a set of technical advances, and those technical advances of computing scattering and let's say, for example, Large Hadron Collider, doing QCD and so forth, those technical advances are of direct relevance to the problem, a different problem, completely different problem, which is uh, classical uh, gravitational interactions of two bodies. Okay? So you could think of it as um, uh, a slick way to be thinking about general relativity which then allows you to do certain advanced calculations. And there's a whole set of, you could say, understanding and technologies. By technologies, I mean integrals, dueling integrals, that you import into a field, a, a different field. And you take one field, information from one field, which is completely different, quantum, and you bring it over to a different field, which is classical general relativity, and uh, the reason we can do it, you could say, is this diagram right here, that the distance, at first sight, it looks like the distance between doing quantum field theory and doing classical general relativity is huge, but this diagram says no, they're actually very close. Okay, And then there is some issues you have to deal with, like you say you're doing quantum, and indeed we are, so you have to understand how to remove all the quantum efficiently so you don't get too entangled, you get rid of it quickly because you're not interested in that for the problem of uh, gravitational waves from two compact sources. Okay? I hope that uh, clarified you know, the philosophy of why we're doing something which at first sight looks completely crazy. <laughs> why would you do this? Well, oh, maybe if you're here tomorrow for the colloquium, I'll show you what we can actually do with this logic. Okay. Any more questions? Are we super over time? About five minutes, I guess. Oh, I still have a little time? You have minus five oh, minutes. Oh, minus five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So probably we skip some questions and I'll leave it on to later on the exercise of questions, right? So let's thank V for the first lecture. And now the cough break.